All right, so um, our next speaker starting us off after the break is Bill Barheit, um, founder of Abra, and he's going to be talking a little bit about the technology behind uh, crypto collateralized uh, uh, contracts. So uh, I think we're in for a, you know, a great talk, and let's please give it up for Bill. All right, so while we're waiting for the slides, um, a couple of things. This is not a business talk. This is a tech talk. So if you're interested in what Abra is doing, why we're doing it, uh, the details of our business, um, there's plenty of material online for that. Uh, I, I'm here to talk about what's going on under the, under the hood, uh, behind the curtains with our um, technology. Is that working? It's not froze. Uh, Mac froze. OK. Yeah, I've never had that. Yeah. All right, so um, while we're figuring that out, uh, oh, is it going to take a while? Are we rebooting? Or? I think I might have to. OK, might have to reboot. Yeah, I have not. All right, well, since I get extra time, uh, I will give you a business overview of Abra then. So um, this is uh, the f free time. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my company Abra is a crypto wallet platform that allows you to get price exposure uh, as an investor to, in theory, almost any asset in the world. We started out with um, uh, fiat currencies and a uh, large number of cryptocurrencies. And recently, we announced that we've created a synthetic version of the entire NASDAQ, which we're going to be launching outside the US in a few weeks, and then uh, hopefully inside the US uh, later this year. Um, and basically, the, the product works as one kind of big HD wallet for the tech initiated among us and uses uh, Bitcoin-based uh, multi-sig, uh, effectively smart contracts, but, but P2SH uh, smart contracts to give people synthetic price exposure to any assets. And uh, the purpose of the talk is to explain to you actually how that works, um, both from the consumer-facing perspective as well as uh, the internal-facing perspective in terms of how we eliminate the consumer's counterparty risk to Abra. Um, so inside of Abra, we actually run um, effectively two different businesses, right? One is the technology shop, which implements all of the um, the backend uh, scripting or the wallet scripting uh, and everything related to what's happening uh, on chain. Everything that happens in the Abra wallet is 100% on chain. It's a non custodial HD wallet that makes this extremely complex because, the, in other words, the consumer is holding their own collateral to these contracts. Uh, and we have, so there's no chance to get this wrong. It has to work. Uh, and, and so the other part of the operation is the financial engineering part part of the operation where we're actually trading in real time to eliminate the consumer's uh, counterparty risk on the contracts. So how are we doing? Should I keep going? I want to use your, because the USB is not popping up, but I have your slides that you gave me. That's, that's this. You're good. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, we're good. All right. I think we're back in business. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Very good. All right, so this is meant to be a handout. Sorry for the oogles of text. But again, the purpose of this, uh, uh, of the app for Abra, is facilitating global financial inclusion, giving people who are in hard to reach or, or economies that normally wouldn't have access to certain financial services, whether it's investing, uh, payments and money transfer, remittances, uh, eventually peer to peer credits, to give them that access using a model that works outside of the traditional banking system uh, in a way that's legal, all right? And so we wanted to create a 100% unhackable solution at the same time, right? Uh, as you can imagine, uh, if, if we're going to be holding or contracts worth billions of dollars, and I say holding in a logical sense, uh, since we're actually not holding consumer funds, it's really important that, that somebody can't just come in and, and hack uh, you know, the entire uh, pool of, of money in the system. And so the idea is to create this, this synthetic asset model that effectively uses Bitcoin to give consumers price exposure to any liquid asset, 
right? We call them crypto collateralized contracts or C3. It's 100% Bitcoin based today. Uh, we do have the ability to do this with other uh, crypto assets, particularly uh, forks of Bitcoin as well as now Ether. We've launched a native Ether wallet inside the app. Um, but the app basically has 26 synthetic cryptocurrencies. So we actually, uh, as a pretty much a large test, global test, created 26 uh, synthetic altcoins using Bitcoin. So if you're holding Zcash and Abra, you're actually getting synthetic exposure to Zcash via Bitcoin. Um, and we've processed almost a billion dollars in transaction volume over the last like year, uh, actually 14 or so months, uh, between the fiat positions, there's 50 fiat, uh, synthetic fiat currencies and 26 uh, synthetic cryptocurrencies in the system, uh, that has processed almost a billion dollars already. And again, uh, the way this works is, is what you're holding, uh, and I'll just skip to the, the next uh, slide to show you this, what you're holding is a, a, a one big HD wallet. All right, uh, whether it's the Bitcoin uh, or the synthetic assets, and separately from that, of course, the, the Ether, Litecoin, and BCH, which are also uh, native within the HD wallets. But everything that you see that looks like a traditional asset here, dollars uh, or other cryptos beyond the ones I mentioned, is synthetic, meaning it's Bitcoin uh, tied to a, a, a contract. And I'm gonna show you how that works. Um, so the user can deposit Bitcoin directly to collateralize the contract. They have to collateralize the contract somehow. So in English, if you're buying $1,000 price exposure to Apple, the $1,000 worth of Bitcoin has to come from somewhere, and that's the consumer's responsibility. They can either do that via the banking system, and if they do it via the banking system, what they're actually doing is buying Bitcoin from one of our exchange partners to collateralize the contract, or if they actually know Bitcoin, they can actually deposit the Bitcoin directly. And because our app is global, and we don't have the banking integration, done everywhere yet, we're working on that, about 60% of the deposits are Bitcoin based and 40% are fiat. And the 40% that are fiat are mostly the US and Europe where we have uh, exchange partners live and fully integrated where you can take your fiat, deposit it at our exchange partner and unbeknownst to you, it just shows up as collateral in the app. So they don't actually know the process for the collateralization. They just, to, to them it looks like the way you use Venmo, all right? All right, so, so that's the first part of understanding Abra, right? That at its core, it's one big Bitcoin wallet. The second part of understanding Abra is understanding how the smart contract technology works. So today, Abra is uh, basically using a multi-sig P2SH model where the consumer is collateralizing one side and signing one side and Abra is signing the other side. Soon we'll be migrating this from two of two to two of three. Uh, today I'm just focusing on what we've got, not where we're going. I actually have other slides on where we're going, but I, that's normally an hour and a half. Uh, so I only have 25 minutes. So uh, all contracts within Abra settle on the Bitcoin blockchain with actual delivery at the latest every 25 days. So in English, the contracts roll over every 25 days. We do this for uh, legal reasons in the US related to uh, commodity swap transactions, which I won't bore you with. Um, and a smart contract basically includes uh, a normal UTXO plus some extra information because we have to know the price at entry time in order to determine who's in the money at rollover or exit time, okay? so. The addressing is just, it's just a normal Bitcoin payment address. Uh, there's nothing special about that. We use uh, Bitcoin the way it was meant to be used. There's nothing extra. Uh, there's no extra off-chain or side-chain technology here. It is 100% on-chain settled, okay? We also have this ability to do smart contract uh, hedge amendments. And so what this means is, is that if you're using a Bitcoin wallet to get price exposure to Zcash, Monero, uh, the US dollar, and Apple at the same time, uh, rather than basically do, by the way, these transactions are very, very large, right? So our mining fees tend to be much larger uh, because of the nature of multi-sig transactions versus others. There's days when Abra has done significantly over 1% of on-chain transactions. That's not a goal, by the way. We simply have no choice. The, trans the transactions have to be on-chain and they're larger than other transactions. So we get end up with a disproportionate amount of on-chain transactions, as opposed to like Coinbase where 99.99% of their transactions are off-chain. Um, 
Okay, so so this contract amendment actually uh, concept actually allows us to simplify or or improve upon uh, the amount of data we're using, how often we have to write to the chain, uh, et cetera, et cetera, by basically making amendments to the existing contracts, uh, and we can basically chain chain these as long as there's enough value uh, in the uh, unspent output that we're using. Again, this is something that I could easily spend a half hour on because uh, it's super interesting, uh, but in the interest of time, I want to introduce the topic to you. So this is the the kind of over overall architecture of what our smart contract system looks like. It's going to change soon when we when we roll out the third party Oracle function. Uh, today, um, it's kind of, a, uh, how would I best describe it? Mutually assured non-destruction because it's a two of two system, uh, meaning that the consumer uh, can't screw Abra and Abra can't screw the consumer. But um, if the consumer, uh, the consumer has to write down the backup phrase to use the app because if they don't, if they don't do it, we don't let them. Uh, but if they do lose the app and the backup phrase and Abra's in the money on the contracts, then we obviously have a problem. So to address that, one of the things we're doing is we're rolling out a contract Oracle uh, function uh, later this year. It'll be an N of M uh, uh, Oracle, which means that, uh, did I say that backwards? M of N, uh, I, I know my alphabet. An M of N Oracle function which means it, eventually it won't be just in one geography, it'll be in multiple geographies, which makes it even harder to shut down. So it'll use, th use things like Shamir's uh, secret sharing to um, even further distribute the private key of the, um, the Oracle. All right, so that protects both the consumer if Abra goes away and it protects Abra if the consumer uh, loses their key. All right, so if, if you've studied smart contracts at all, you know, this, this probably looks familiar to you. The difference is, is that what Abra is doing today to create the synthetic cur currencies is very, very simple. It doesn't require more than what Bitcoin Script does, which is fantastic. That's part of what makes Abra so secure. The contracts are very simple, okay? Now, what's really complex uh, for the uninitiated is when you enter into this contract with Abra, effectively what you've done if you're getting price exposure to, a to Apple uh, is you've taken Bitcoin and you've effectively shorted the Bitcoin versus Apple as a consumer, right? To you, it just looks like you put collateral in the contract equal to, to Apple. But if the price of Apple goes up you're ex versus Bitcoin, you're expecting more Bitcoin at the end of the contract um, and, and vice versa. If, Bitcoin, if Apple goes down versus Bitcoin, uh, you're going to actually lose Bitcoin. But Abra is the counterparty to those contracts, which means from the consumer's perspective, the consumer has counterparty risk versus versus Abra. Now that's unacceptable because we're not marketing this as some sophisticated derivative system. We're marketing this as a consumer-facing retail investment platform. So the consumer should not be in a position to have to understand anything about counterparty risk or the mechanics of hedging and any of that. So the way we deal with that is, is that we basically create um, not only the smart contract, but we create a real-time hedging system that completely eliminates that counterparty risk, with one exception, right? The system depends upon the price of Bitcoin being above zero. It doesn't deal with systemic risk, right? If you have a gold swap, like if you're buying gold versus dollars and gold goes to zero and you're settling in gold, you owe the counterparty an infinite amount of gold. It's the same thing here, right? So we can't account for the systemic risk of Bitcoin, uh, but if Bitcoin is worth one penny even, this system works. So last year when Bitcoin fell 85% and people were holding synthetic dollars and we were making them whole almost every day, right? Um, Abra didn't lose a penny. All right. so, so again, Abra is taking the long side to the consumer shorts from a financial engineering perspective and it's important then that, and we report this to our, our board, one of my board members is sitting here, he can vouch for this. In our board deck every single month, we actually report the net exposure of the entire ABRA network. Okay, meaning if you take all the consumers' positions, all the ABRA hedges, and you net them up, what is not only the current mark to market, but what, what is the mark to market regardless of any movement except for the catastrophic failure of Bitcoin, and generally that number. If it's not less than $25,000, which is around the fair to zero, we've done something really wrong, okay, and it never has been. And it won't be when you understand how this works, okay? All right, so there's three uh, functional aspects to making sure the hedge works correctly. The first is the initial collateralization, meaning I want to deposit, here, I'm, in, this, in this example, I'm using uh, Ethereum Classic, all right? It could be Apple shares, could be dollars, doesn't matter. It, the mechanics are exactly the same, okay? I want to buy, uh, 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 1,000 ETC, I made these prices up. Uh, the, the spot price for BTC is $4,000. Uh, the spot price for ETC is $4. Effectively, uh, app, 
uh, Alice has to get one Bitcoin on her app because that is the collateral to give her price exposure uh, to the asset. Okay. At the same time, there's a hedging operation going on where Abra is effectively borrowing one BTC from a lender. We've actually borrowed that long in advance of this happening because we can't borrow such small amounts in real time. So we pay the extra interest on that. But we are actually converting in real time the one BTC to 1,000 ETC, right? Via uh, some uh, you know, Coinbase or another platform. Now, that is Abra's asset. That is not the consumer's asset. The consumer is holding their own Bitcoin, right? What I'm doing right in the bottom half of the slide is simply for my balance sheet to hedge away counterparty risk on the transaction. So the fact that I borrowed Bitcoin and sold it for Ethereum Classic, that has nothing to do with Alice. That's on my balance sheet. Okay? But why are they willing to lend me that Bitcoin in the first place? Because they see that I'm in a multi-sig contract with Alice that's 100% collateralized. Right? So even though not only are we one of the largest borrowers of Bitcoin in the world, we actually pay infinitely lower interest rates than pretty much everyone else because our contracts are fully collateralized by the consumer. Okay? So that just gets the money in the system. So now we have to deal with what happens when the price goes up and the price goes down and you want to take money out of the system. So let's start with the, the price of uh, Ethereum Classic goes up. Right? So now I basically started with the same collateral as before. But at the end of the transaction, somehow I have to end up with more Bitcoin, right? So in this case, if the price of Bitcoin stays the same and the price of Ethereum Classic doubles, right? In theory, I should end up with uh, you know double the amount of Bitcoin. But right, remember when I sold the Ethereum Classic for or, I, or sold the Bitcoin for Ethereum Classic on the, on the last slide? That means when I convert it back to Bitcoin it buys double the amount of Bitcoin that it used to. Turns out it buys just enough to make Alice whole and just enough to make my lender whole, right? Which is the arrows you see in the slide. So now, and by the way, it doesn't matter whether the price doubles or triples, the math works, okay? Now, what happens if the price goes the other way, right? Well, if, if the price goes the other way, meaning that the price of uh, Ethereum Classic falls in half, Aber uh, Alice is now holding too much Bitcoin. So she will automatically, via the script, end up giving, in this instance, half the Bitcoin to Abra. Now, that's good because the Ethereum Classic that I'm holding is now worth half of what it used to, so I don't have enough to pay back the lender. But it turns out the Ethereum Classic I'm holding converted back to Bitcoin, plus the Bitcoin Alice gives to me is exactly enough to pay back the lender. And now both parties are whole again. Okay? So, sorry for doing that quickly. Took me a year to figure this out. So, and I, and I, I was a quantic Goldman, by the way. It took me a year to figure this out. All right, so, so this is the mechanics of what we've automated minus the borrow. When the borrow we do in advance because we're borrowing millions of dollars and millions of dollars and balancing constantly. Um, and so you can't do that in real time. Plus, you know, there's too much of a risk with block cycles and whatnot. So we go to our lenders well in advance, and we have a, a small trading desk where we work that out. Everything else that I've described to you is 100% automated. If you buy synthetic XRP in Abra, your counterparty risk to Abra is hedged away in less than a minute. It has to be. Otherwise, it would be unethical, uh, in my opinion. Okay. So this is just uh, the kind of the, the, the flows of what is actually happening uh, behind the scenes, right? So the customer, as I said, they've gone long Bitcoin. Um, they've, gone, they've taken an, an initial long position, but then what they're actually doing is they're shorting uh, Bitcoin versus that Ethereum Classic in order to get price exposure to Ethereum Classic, which is what you see in that um, second, second column there. And then Abra is taking the long position in Bitcoin uh, by going short effectively Ethereum Classic. Now, the consumer doesn't really understand this, right? And that's why it's so important that this is a delta neutral, right? And, and, and why it's basically got zero price exposure to the consumer. Uh, because otherwise, I'd have to ethically sit every single consumer down and make sure they understand this. Right. So if you look at our terms of service, uh, it's very clear that Abra is doing this in the system. Right? Okay, so, and then the final, um, the final column here shows that we have neutral exposure by being able to settle correctly under all, under all circumstances. So again, 
uh, with that specific example, there's different mechanics. So if this is a dollar, if synthetic dollar, synthetic Ethereum Classic, synthetic Apple, the right-hand column looks slightly different, right? So if I'm hedging that Ripple or Ethereum Classic, there's only one way I can do it today. Right? In traditional financial engineering, what you would want to do is you would want to buy an NDF, a non-deliverable forward contract, uh, between uh, Bitcoin and Ripple, like you would if you were uh, British Petroleum reckoning in pounds and you were doing a lot of business in dollars, you would buy NDF contracts to offset um, Forex risk between the dollar and the pound. That doesn't exist between the dollar and, or, or Bitcoin and XRP or Bitcoin and ETC. Those markets are just tiny. Uh, so we create them synthetically by borrowing Bitcoin and then selling it in real time. And that interest is effectively, effectively the cost of the insurance contract. And that's offset by a spread that the consumer pays when they enter into the, uh, the contract in the first place. Now, that, that's how it works for the synthetic cryptos. Now, if it's synthetic fiat, it's actually much simpler. If I'm holding synthetic euros, right, we have lots of people in Europe using this. They put Bitcoin in the app and they convert it to euros. Uh, what, what actually happens is, is that Abra is buying future contracts in Bitcoin versus the dollar, and then offsetting that in real time with the NDF of the dollar versus euro, which obviously exists. Uh, and those markets are both highly liquid, um, and Abra can often make money on those futures contracts because we're the short counterparty, and that pays a premium most days, and that allows us to lower the cost dramatically for the consumer. And then um, on the announcement we, we recently made around making stocks available for our international, uh, NASDAQ stocks available for our international users, it uses a similar model where uh, the consumer is um, uh, effectively uh, taking the short position of Bitcoin versus Apple, and then Abra will buy the dollar uh, Bitcoin future again, but that will be offset either by borrowing shares from a prime broker or uh, doing something like future contracts on the other side, and again, highly liquid markets. And so we use uh, directly integrated services like interactive brokers and others to uh, make that work, but again, in real time, right? So if you push buy on that share, the hedge has happened usually in less than one to two minutes. It takes a little bit longer on the stock side just because of the way the APIs work, but generally less than two minutes. So the entire system does a recalculation every five minutes, and we run these Google Sheets uh, with big red flashing lights that say, you know, what's the uh, total exposure across the entire Abra system uh, between consumers and our hedging operation, and um, we're, you know, we have somebody who's got it open on their screen literally uh, every minute they're in the office and then they get paged to, you know, via the to text message, whatever, uh, when they're not in the office if, if something happens that shouldn't, it's never happens, uh, but we, we, we assume that it, that it would so that we, um, you know, are, are diligent in how we do this. So uh, normally this takes hours to explain correctly. Uh, you got the 20 minute uh, or the 19 minute version plus the free time. So I'm happy to uh, take a few minutes of questions and then pick up the, the conversation on, online if anybody has. So I think I saw your hand first and then I saw so hand over here. So go ahead. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Avra. I've preached the gospel of Avra to the remittance community ad nauseum. Um, Thank you. And you've done a masterful job at kind of circumventing the traditional regulatory regimes with your primary business or your first business in the remittance area. I was just wondering, with your foray into the securities industry and tangentially touching the securities industry, are you planning to implement the same strategy uh, to basically kind of dance around the, not dance around, but uh, avoid the legacy regulators who yeah. would probably want some sort of regulation on that? Yeah, so it's a complex topic. Um, I actually spent the entire day at the SEC last week with, uh, I met the chairman, I met Esther who's here today, I believe, uh, and some others. Um, in terms of functionally how this works, um, I think that there are ways to do this with probably without actually being, uh, you know, SEC registered in some way. The problem is the marketing, right? So I can't market to consumers the issuance of some price exposure to Apple or NASDAQ or, or spiders um, without SEC oversight. It's just not possible because right? it looks like a security swap from their perspective. But it's worse than that because Dodd-Frank mandated rules for security swaps. It's nine years later, the SEC cho chose to ignore the implementation of those rules in the legislation. 
and I brought this up and they assured me that they're working on it, but I can also assure you that they don't include crypto because the Dodd-Frank was passed when crypto was about 50 cents, right? So, so that's a big problem, not for me, for the industry, right? Because this is way bigger outside the U.S. than it is inside the U.S. So if I never market the ability to buy Apple via Bitcoin in the U.S., it will mean nothing to ever, right? But I wanted to work here. Right? I, if I'm doing it in 154 countries, I wanted to do it in 155. Um, so we're working on that part, you know, to figure that out. But the U.S. regulation is infinitely more complex in this regard than everyone else's, uh, especially when it comes to something that looks like a security swap. The other side, which is commodities, if you notice, I talked about the 25-day delivery and, and that stuff, and uh, that has to do with the commodities uh, area, which is different than the securities area. Um, and, and so I won't bore, bore folks with that, but the CFTC issued guidance on what actual delivery means if your uh, asset settles in Bitcoin, uh, basically taking their old guidance on actual delivery for traditional assets like oil and other commodities. Um, it's a complex topic, uh, but um, you know we're uh, you know I'm not going to jail for anyone. So we're doing this right uh, across the board. This is not just about you know how do you get around regulation. It's it's a very complex topic. The first thing is is make sure that the regulators understand that you're doing right by the consumer. So when they see that the consumer doesn't have counterparty risk to Abra, the nature of the conversation changes, and also because we're not holding the collateral. Right, and then and then beyond that, you have to get into the very nuanced mechanics of, of, of what you're doing. Yeah. Sure, sorry for the long, long answer. Yeah. As uh, an organizer, I actually want to ask a question. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, so I'm interested in more of your uh, the multi the way you operate the multi-state contract, um, because the way I understood it, uh, every 25 days you basically have a transaction happen. Uh, between, you know, the, unless you close the position beforehand. Sure, unless yeah. you close the position beforehand. Um, yeah. But so, how does if somebody's holding synthetic um, ETC or USD or whatever, um, and it's an HD wallet where it's every transaction has to be two of two signed? Um, how do you carry out the transaction without necessarily the involvement of the user? Uh, they have pre-signed in some cases oh. the transaction, uh, and so that will change when we go to the Oracle model. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's, uh, that's only true in some cases. Um, there's some cases where they've pre-signed. There's other cases where we actually just don't publish the UTXO uh, until uh, another transaction happens. Yeah, yeah. But th it's, there's, there's nuances of why we're doing that in different cases that I have to get my CTO to explain. Yeah, right. I'm just curious that when you have a consumer holding the Bitcoin as collateral and you are borrowing, so in the sense that when you have a large amount of demand, would you like inventory affect the price of the Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think the single best use case for Bitcoin over the next five years is the collateralization of real world assets to facilitate banking. As a matter of fact, I don't even know what number two is. So until we have a second layer that can actually enable real world payments, this is the best use case of Bitcoin I've ever seen. So by definition, there's not enough Bitcoin right now to collateralize all the assets one would want to do with this. Well, I think there's the answer to your question. Yeah, I mean, If I'm right. Now, I don't think Apple is going to be the only company to do this, right? So, sorry, I didn't hear what you said. So would that become a limitation that you, know, you won't be able because there's... It wouldn't become a limitation on price because the price can keep yeah, going up yeah, forever. The limitation is supply The limitation is, is uh, layer one. That's the limitation. And so eventually, Abra wallets will also become Lightning wallets. Uh, there will be a server version of, of the Abra wallet for exchanges and other banks to use and hold synthetic assets. Those would also be Lightning wallets, which we're going to announce soon. And, and those will all be able to communicate at layer two. That'll solve most of the problem. But even then, as a settlement layer, layer one will have to scale better. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest risk to Abra, by far. Awesome. So we have I one think, more question. Uh, we can do one more quick question, yes. Okay. Yeah, Bill, I was just wondering, um, what, oh, thank you. Um, when you're um, taking these very uh, complex hedge positions, I would guess that it would cost a lot of money to do that. 
Um, so th how do you pay for that? Who's yeah, paying for that? The, the hedges aren't complex. The, the overall mechanics of the system are complex. I'm sim in the case of an altcoin, I'm borrowing Bitcoin and selling it for XRP. That's not complex. Um, the interest rate is, is, non is non-zero. That's offset by the consumer's spread. On the case of equities and fiat currencies, I'm actually making money on most hedges uh, because the, the future contract on Bitcoin has, has a premium on one side versus the other side. In most days, the short side, which is the side I'm taking, because I have short exposure, that pays a two to three basis point premium. That's why when we launch equities uh, internationally, the initial cost is going to be zero because on average, Abra should be making a reasonable percentage of return on equity, even though I'm not actually holding the crypto collateral. Amazing. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I, I think we have to call it there just because we're running about, uh, you know, over 10 minutes behind. Um, but let's give uh, Bill another round of applause. That was a really, really interesting conversation. Thank you so much.